Hello everyone, thank you for coming to my talk and my name is Ignan and today we are going to talk about Linux disk encryption and how to speed it up. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, I work at Cloudflare, I do performance and security there. I'm also passionate about security and cryptography and I also enjoy level, level programming and Linux kernel is one of my favorites. I also do some bootloaders and other uh, low-level scary C stuff. Okay, uh, let's go. So before uh, we start talking about uh, uh, DMCrypt, let's talk about encrypting data at rest in general. And before we start talking about encrypting uh, data at rest in general, uh, let's basically review uh, the modern operating system storage stack from a high-level perspective to understand where you can apply encryption these days. So this is a simplified version of the storage stack. At the top you have the uh, your applications, which actually implement your business logic. The applications write, read and write data in files and send them to the file systems. The file system translate these files into blocks and send them to the operating system block subsystem, which then later uh, routes it to appropriate uh, storage device drivers which talk to actual storage hardware and store the data. And when we uh, start thinking about where we can, can we apply encryption, we can basically apply encryption at each of these uh, layers. So first of all, you can basically just buy self-encrypting disks and there is a standard there called OPAL uh, and the, those disks will basically transparently encrypt the data for you. Uh, secondly, you can just uh, implement encryption in, in the block subsystem of, of the operating system. And the examples, uh, the known examples here are LUX and DMCrypt, which will be the main topic of today's presentation. We also have BitLocker on Windows and FileVault on Mac OS. Um, then we can actually encrypt data in the operating system file system layer and here we also know uh, there are some examples like ecryptfs which is an older system and we have xt4 encryption or it now uh, developed into a, a, a module called fscrypt which is actually supports not only xt4 file system and finally you can do encryption in the application layer just like add code to your application which encrypts data before sending it to the file system and you are done. So each of these approaches have their pros and cons. So the pros for storage hardware encryption is they are simple, it's just there, so uh, everything is handled by a hardware, so it requires very little configuration. It's fully transparent to applications, uh, applications do not don't know or care if your uh, desk encrypts uh, the data. And it's usually faster than other layers because uh, you don't waste the uh, your uh, main uh, host CPU cycle to do the encryption. There are some downsides, of course. Uh, most of these uh, implementations are proprietary, so you have no visibility into the implementation. Thus, you have no auditability, which sometimes leads to poor security. And uh, recent findings show that some of the implementations of self-improvement drives are so bad that Microsoft, for example, decided to switch to software-based uh, disk encryption by default in their Windows operating systems quite recently. Then we have the block layer encryption, so encryption in the operating system uh, block subsystem. It's very similar to hardware disk encryption, uh, but uh, so because it requires little configuration and it's also fully transparent to your applications. But the advantage is if you run an open, exist, uh, open source operating system like Linux, it's open and auditable. The downsides, of course, uh, like any other st block storage based encryption, it requires somewhat specialized crypto because the conventional stream ciphers are not very suited to encrypt uh, random block storage. It may have a performance impact because now you're doing the actual encryption on your host CPU, so you're wasting CPU cycles, like additional CPU cycles, 
and now uh, unlike hardware encryption your encryption keys are stored in the main RAM of the operating system which makes them more vulnerable to different RAM based attacks uh, then we have the file system layer encryption uh, the advantages of that it's also somewhat transparent to applications uh, Again, if you're using an open source open uh, open source operating system, it's open and auditable. The advantage, another advantage, it's more fine grained. So, for for example, uh, you can have different directories in your file system which are encrypted or not encrypted. Uh, you you can have different directories with different uh, encryption keys, and as a result, different users of your operating system even can have their own encryption keys for their data. And also you have more choice for crypto and potential integrity support because at the file system layer, uh, the operating system has more context. So it sees f full files rather than like independent random blocks of data and can do more things. The downside is again, with like any other software encryption, you can have a performance impact. Your encryption keys are in RAM. Uh, it's more complex to configure because all that fine grain uh, ability requires more configuration. And another downside is you may have unencrypted metadata. So, for example, uh, free space or file size is not encrypted when you use file system layer encryption. And then again, you can have the application layer encryption. So um, it's relatively open and auditable. If you own the source code for your own application, you can basically read it. It's fine grain. Again, you can really implement what you want and you have full groups of flexibility. You can implement any crypto algorithms you like. Uh, the downsides are as other software based encryption, uh, data encryption solutions. So you have encryption keys in RAM. Uh, you actually have to code support. Your, your application has to have source code, which does the encryption itself. So you have to develop it. And you may also have unencrypted metadata, your file sizes and free space will not be encrypted. And one of the downsides is again full crypto flexibility. Not every uh, application developer knows how to properly use uh, low level uh, cryptographical primitives. So, actually, your implementation of uh, encryption may actually be insecure, even if you use like uh, a modern library like OpenSSL. Okay, so let's switch back to block layer operating system block layer encryption and Linux. And in Linux, uh, uh, we use Lux and DMcrypt. So Cloudflare is a SaaS company, and like many other SaaS companies, we prefer uh, operating system block layer encryption. So it uh, basically we want the encryption uh, as a feature of the platform, so it should be transparent to the applications regardless of whether application supports encryption or not. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, actually don't want uh, uh, to depend on like uh, potentially vulnerable implementations of hardware disk encryption. But on the other hand, we don't need the flexibility of the file system layer encryption. So block layer disk encryption is that sweet spot like we use and many other companies do. And because we use Linux, we kind of use Lux and DMcrypt. So what is Lux and DMcrypt? Uh, to talk about DMcrypt, we need to just review Device Mapper in Linux first. Uh, so Device Mapper is, a, is, a, is an interesting framework. Uh, so what it does is essentially the follows. Again, you have your applications which read and write files uh, to the file systems. These file system normally will translate these files into blocks and send them down the stack to the block device drivers to be actually stored. So device mapper framework actually can insert itself in between and intercept these blocks as they go between the file system and the block device drivers and provide the additional some uh, additional functionality like we have DM rate which can create software rate arrays. We have DM mirror which can back up data and uh, the topic of this uh, presentation will be DMcrypt, which basically encrypts the data transparently. So if we zoom into DMcrypt, again, we have the file system, we have the block device drivers. So DMcrypt inserts itself in between and 
Basically, when a file system wants to write a block, it intercepts the request, encrypts it, and sends it down the stack. When a file system reads some, wants to read some data, it basically uh, intercepts uh, the uh, cipher text, uh, the read cipher text from the block device driver, decrypts it, and sends the plain text to the file system. And which is uh, one thing which is does good is it doesn't implement its own cryptography. It uses a, a well-known uh, standardized Linux uh, kernel crypto API, which is hopefully have been there for some time and uh, it's open source and have sufficiently and was sufficiently reviewed to consider it uh, more or less secure. So this all well and good. So we enabled disk encryption uh, everywhere in Cloudflare, but it wasn't without problems. So we started to see some potential uh, performance uh, degradation and uh, started to investigating. But basically for the purpose of this talk, we will not present uh, some real data which we got from our production, but uh, uh, to surface the problems in the DMCrypt itself, we'll present a benchmark uh, which is, tries to avoid some kind of bias around hardware and would be easy to be reproducible on a laptop, but still show the problems in the encrypt. So to avoid the bias of the of a specific disk or hardware, what can we use? We can use the fastest disk out there, which is basically no disk. And on Linux, it's very easy to create a RAM-based disk, so a disk in RAM with the DRD module. This is what we do here. We create a four gigabyte RAM disk. Uh, uh, now we allocate a 2 megabyte file for uh, a Lux Detach header, which I come back, uh, for why I, I will come back in a second. Then we format our uh, newly created RAM disk into Lux uh, using our Detach header. And then we basically create an instance of DMCrypt on top of uh, our uh, newly created RAM disk. So this is our test storage stack. At the bottom layer, we have uh, uh, the RAM disk. Uh, so we created a DMCrypt instance on top. And for the purpose of this benchmarking, we will use no file system, again, to avoid the bias of a particular file system implementation in our results. So in this setup, what we can do is basically we can read or write directly to this uh, DMCrypt instance and our data will be transparently encrypted or decrypted or we can write directly to the underlying raw device to actually get the raw IO performance and compare it to with encrypted performance. That's why we use the crypto uh, detached header for LUX because if we didn't, by default, LUX would create, will, would use the first two megabyte of the, our underlying RAM disk to store some metadata for our DMCrypt instance. And when we would write read or write directly to, uh, to our RAM disk, uh, by passing the DMCrypt inst instance, we, we could accidentally erase this data and spoil our experiment. Okay, so let's add some workload. So first we'll just measure a sequential read-write throughput on the under of our underlying RAM disk. So we use this file co uh, FIO command and what we get in result is that we get somewhere about uh, one gigabyte per second of read throughput and one gigabyte per second of write throughput. Uh, throughput. Because we use RAM disk, reads and writes are almost uh, the same. So um, this usually checks out. Now let's see how the same workflow performs uh, on the DMCrypt instance with uh, transparent Linux disk encryption involved. And when we do that, we see that the throughput drop to 150 megabyte per second in, in both directions, which is actually uh, seven times slower. So yes, again, we use software disk encryption. We may expect some performance degradation, but probably not seven times. But what should we expect basically? Uh, Crypt Setup Utility has a handy benchmark commons, which benchmarks uh, specific uh, crypto algorithms you could use uh, to do disk encryption in Linux, and we, if we run the benchmark uh, the, uh, on the default algorithm, which is ISXTS, we get that our test system has uh, uh, like can perform 
1.8 gigabyte uh, uh, per second of uh, decryption and 1.8 gigabyte per second encryption uh, of pure crypto. So basically, if we take the worst case scenario, assuming we just take the whole disk, fully read all the data and then sequentially decrypt it, so we basically read and then decrypt in a two sequential steps uh, with one gigabyte per second of reads and 1.8 giga gigabyte per second, per second of decryption, we could probably, and the same, basically the same for writes because it's symmetric, we could probably expect for that sequential system to give us around 700 megabyte per second of throughput, but what we're actually seeing is around 300 megabyte, like 150 megabyte in each direction. So it's way below our reasonable expected case. So what we did, we tried to uh, improve it. And we tried different things. We tried to use different cryptographic algorithms, but IS6TS seems to be the fastest, at least on x86. Uh, DMCrypt actually have some kind of like additional options or performance flag, they call it, called same CPU crypt and submit from crypt CPUs. We tried to play with these, but we didn't get any uh, reasonable performance uh, uh, boost. We also tried like to use file system level encryption, and it ended up being even slower, and again potentially less secure because we would end up having like unencrypted metadata. So yeah, we're we're desperate. We tried everything, but could not like squeeze out a single bit from our disk encryption. <clears throat> so we decided to ask for help. We asked the community, we wrote our findings to the DMCrypt mailing list, but the only thing we got back is this uh, reply. If the numbers disturb you, then this is from a lack of understanding on your side. You are probably unaware that encryption is a heavyweight operation. And at this point I was wondering, is encryption is that heavyweight? Uh, so I decided to do a scientific research on that, and by scientific research, I mean I typed into Google, is encryption expensive? And surprisingly, one of the first meaningful uh, results I got is a blog post, blog post from my own company, where a fellow engineer did a study on the uh, how costly uh, <clears throat> encryption for Cloudflare is, but in the context of TLS. So Cloudflare processes, uh, does a lot of TLS uh, termination and processes a lot of TLS connections. So uh, encryption in TLS is very important to us as well. But one of the uh, conclusions uh, my colleague made is that using TLS is very cheap, even at the scale of Cloudflare. So in their study, they, we used less than 30% of our CPU uh, to do the encryption, which is uh, not that bad. Yeah, so, and basically uh, disk encryption uses similar algorithms as TLS, so why should it be more expensive uh, because of crypto? So based on this, I decided to look into <coughs> DMCrypt implementation in the Linux kernel in more details. So again, <coughs> again, we have a file system, we have the block device drivers, so we have our DMCrypt instance in between and it uses a crypto API. Turns out when the file system wants to write some data, it sends a write request, which is intercepted by DMCrypt, but DMCrypt does not immediately process it. Instead, it queues it into a, a kernel work queue called kcrypd for processing some later time. Uh, when the, that time comes, uh, dmcrypt sends it over to crypto API, but modern crypto API is also synchronous. It also may have uh, work queues. Uh, it has more work queues, so like it usually has one work queue per CPU, and that request may end up on one of these queues and get queued and then processed, like actually encrypted and uh, returned back to dmcrypt. But dmcrypt again does not dispatch it immediately, it, it queues it again into a different structure, this time it's a red-black tree where uh, 
the encrypt sorts these requests for them to arrive in some kind of sequential order and then it has a dedicated thread called the encrypt write which actually then takes these requests from that thread block tree and dispatches them to programized drive. Similar happens in, uh, for reads, when a file system issues a read request, again, it, be, it gets intercepted by the encrypt, but not processed immediately. It gets queued on a yet another kernel work queue called kcryptd.io. Then at some more convenient time, it gets dispatched to the block device drivers, uh, where uh, it actually the ciphertext gets read. It, it, it returned back to the encrypt, but the encrypt again does not process it immediately. It queues it on our already familiar kcrypt D work queue, then at some point later dispatches it to crypto API where it can get queued again. And when the crypto API actually decrypts the request, it gets returned to the file system. And that's a lot of queuing to handle one uh, read or write requests. Uh, last year I was at SRECon in Singapore and engineers from Google made a very interesting presentation on the relationship between queuing effects and a tail latency in a general software system and that got resonated with me and one of the takeaways I had from there is that a significant amount of tail latency is due to queuing effects and I actually encourage towards your presentation on its own but in a nutshell, uh, uh, so in this system, we may queue uh, a read or write request up to four times before actually get it processed. Uh, I assume no malicious intentions, and I assume that probably if these queues exist, there should be a reason. So I decided to actually do some JIT archaeology. Luckily, the whole Linux kernel source in the VCS, so you can uh, try to reconstruct the reasons why the queues exist. So kcrypd uh, kernel work queue was there from the beginning uh, since 2005 where uh, the mcrypt code was actually merged into the mainline uh, kernel. It was initially only invoked for read requests with the comment in the code it would be very unwise to do decryption in an interrupt context. And it makes, made sense in 2005 because in 2005 Linux API, crypto API was not asynchronous so actually you uh, may end up doing decryption in an interrupt context when you read the data and you shouldn't be doing like a CPU intensive operation in an interrupt context and so this does make sense. Uh, then some more queuing was added to reduce kernel stack usage in 2006 so uh, the kernel stack was quite limited in 2006 and actually to uh, avoid overflowing it uh, this asynchronous behavior was introduced according to the comments. Offloading writes and uh, to threads and IO sorting in the red black tree was added around 2015 with the comment it's better for spinning disk because spinning disk prefer getting sequential IOs uh, and yeah, and it also mentions the C it's better for CFQ scheduler, which is actually deprecated now uh, from the Linux kernel. And turns out uh, we were not the only ones experienced performance degradation from this extensive queuing, because uh, again in 2015 there are some commits to optionally revert some of the queuing by adding these runtimes uh, uh, flags, which we tried before called same CPU crypt and submit from uh, crypt CPU. So actually uh, someone already saw that there is some degradation with this extensive queuing. So there are things to reconsider here, right? So uh, most code was in, in DM crypt was added with spinning disk in mind. So back in the day where we had spinning disk, which they had disk IO latency much higher than the scheduling latency, you can solve you can solve problems with by adding like uh, additional queues or uh, threads uh, because uh, the context which their latency is negligible to, uh, compared to disk IO latency, which is not true for the modern fast storage. Uh, sorting IO requests in dmcrypt probably violates a do one thing and do it well Unix principle. Uh, sorting 
IO request is a task for the IO schedule and not for a module which does transparent data encryption. Uh, these days, kcrypt-d, work queue in dmcrypt, may be redundant uh, because modern crypt Linux crypto API is asynchronous by itself and it basically can handle uh, the cases uh, where you send it, uh, some data in an interrupt context. So we decided to do a cleanup, uh, to throw away all this extra complexity, which is, seems to be outdated, and turn this back into this, uh, a simple module which does one thing, encrypts, uh, writes, and decrypts read. And we also wanted to take it to an extreme point, uh, so we also wanted to make sure that we will not be queuing in the Linux Crypto API. So we wanted to have a synchronous Linux Crypto API model to process this request. Uh, so as a result, we come up with a simple patch uh, it's basically a patch to dmcrypt which bypasses all queues as, and async threads based on a new runtime flag. Uh, with Linux Crypto API it's a bit more complicated. By default the Linux kernel, uh, Linux kernel may have uh, several implementations of the same crypto algorithm and uh, they all have configured priorities and the Linux kernel selects a particular implementation based on the priority which is basically it considers the best or the most performance in this specific case. But we didn't want to make chances, we wanted to, it to use uh, ISNI uh, in a synchronous way. Uh, ISNI is uh, basically AS, AS hardware implementation in x86 CPUs, which should be the fastest on an x86 platform. But ISNI synchronous implementation is marked as internal with respect to crypto API. So it, it's, it's allowed to be called only for by other crypto API modules and not by uh, external code like dmcrypt. Uh, and also the problem with ASNI, it, it requires the FPU uh, on the x86 and it may not, FPU may not be available in some interrupt contexts because uh, the kernel does not preserve uh, FPU in all cases, especially when you switch uh, in interrupt contexts and kernel code. So what we came up with, uh, just another crypto API module called XTS Proxy. It's a dedicated synchronous ISXTS module. But we didn't implement any crypto on, uh, on its own. So basically what this XTX Proxy does, it, it's a switch. Uh, when it receives an encryption request, it just checks is FPU available in, in the current context. And in most cases, in 99% of the cases, yes. So it's yes, it just forwards the encryption request to the internal synchronous XTS ISNI implementation in the kernel. And it can do that because it's a crypto API module now. So it can use other internal crypto API module. In a very rare cases where FPU is not available, it forwards the uh, encryption or decryption request to a generic software IS implementation in the kernel, which does not require MPU, uh, FPU, although it's uh, slower and can be much slower though. But the uh, advantage of this is this module is fully synchronous. Uh, there is no queuing involved when processing uh, data using this module. Okay, uh, so let's actually redo our experiment. Uh, so again, uh, the nice thing about our patch is uh, uh, it's enable or disabled using a runtime flag. So you don't have to do like a system reboot or stop the world to reconfigure. You can actually do it live uh, on a production or on a test system under a live workload. So here we just relaunch our um, benchmarking workload. Uh, the next thing what we need to do is we need to ensure that our, the kernel has our new XTS proxy module available. So we load it now. Now we enab actually enable this functionality using this scary long command. But in a nutshell, what essentially it does, it reconfigures our dmcrypt instance and does two things. So first, it basically tells dmcrypt do not rely on, uh, on the Linux kernel crypto API uh, 
priority configuration and do not let the kernel choose an implementation for you. Request explicitly to use XTS AX XTS proxy module. And the second thing it does, it basically enables our run fl uh, runtime flag, which was introduced by, uh, uh, by our patch, which tells dmcrypt uh, bypass all the queues, uh, all the dmcrypt queues it has implemented and process all requests uh, synchronously. And finally, when you reconfigure, you need to do this suspend and resume cycle to actually uh, to make your configuration active and uh, for your configuration to take effect. And uh, this is the result actually. So uh, here you can see the point at the point where we actually made our configuration active. We reconfigure the DM crypt to use our new setup. Our read throughput actually immediately almost more than doubled here. And because we are using RAM disk and actually because reads and writes and RAM uh, have similar performance and because IS itself is a symmetric cryptographic algorithm, encryption and decryption also has the same performance. We see kind of similar picture for write throughput. So immediately when enabling our new con updated configuration and patch, our write throughput doubled as well. Uh, just to make sure we're not imagining things, uh, here is a, a snapshot from our real production system. So before we did the test on, on a, uh, on a uh, RAM-based disk for benchmarking, but this is actual result from a production server. And here we see uh, our monitoring system, it uh, mo measures the perceived SSD IO latency from the application's perspective. It's basically the IO weight stats. And uh, this is uh, one SSD in our production and the yellow line shows the IO wait time basically for the raw SSD. And uh, the green line shows uh, the same IO wait latency for the dmcrypt instance on top of that SSD. And we see when we reconfigure our dmcrypt to use our patched runtime flag and XTX crypto module, these latencies converge. And actually we see almost no difference between the uh, raw disk IO wait time and the dmcrypt instance on top IO wait time. And just make sure to, uh, that we're not reimagining ghosts here and we actually have a real service production impact. Here is another comparison from our production. Here we did a three-way comparison of one of our servers, which is performing the CDN, our CDN workload. Uh, so here, on uh, uh, these graphs, you would see the comparison between a P99 response latency from a service which uh, fetches uh, customers' data from our cache, and uh, if we have it, and delivers it to our customers. So here we see three distinct servers in the same data center. So the green line here is a server with unencrypted disk. It has no dmcrypt at all. Um, the red line here is another server, uh, which is the same hardware, same module, uh, model. But when we add dmcrypt, we can see our uh, P99 cache response time spikes. And we see these like spikes of P99 response latency. But the blue line is yet another server with the encrypt, but with our patches enabled. And we see that it's almost indistinguishable in terms of uh, cloud for cache P99 response times uh, from an unencrypted server. So in, with the respect to the service, we actually get uh, disk encryption for free. Yeah, I think uh, that is all what I had for today. Uh, so in this presentation, we basically uh, see that uh, we introduced a simple patch for dmcrypt, which may improve the improve dmcrypt performance and thus transparent disk encryption on Linux by 200 or sometime, in some cases even 300%. The nice thing about it, it's fully compatible with stock dmcrypt, so it doesn't add any fancy crypto. You can actually basically enable or it on disk which was already encrypted so uh, the crypto is compatible there 
and nice thing about it it can be enabled and disabled in runtime without any service disruption so it's easier to test and do like a b testing or, or some other kind of test or enable and disable it if you see the performance degradation uh, we reassured ourselves that modern crypto is fast and cheap so if you see a performance issue with uh, with a, uh, an encryption system don't immediately try to blame encryption itself try to look around if your architecture is not very optimal and some of the assumptions need to be reviewed so the performance degradation is likely elsewhere and for this specific thing is uh, extra queuing may be harmful harmful on modern low latency storage so the encrypt probably was designed with spinning disk in mind but now we move to ssds we move to nvme disks and now we have to reconsider all the assumptions we made for uh, for this dmcrypt in particular and the storage stack in general there are some caveats with the current patch as well uh, from our testing we see that the patch improves performance on small block size high iops workloads if you actually have a workload with a larger block size like more than two megabytes uh, our benchmark showed worse performance uh, the whole setup presented in this presentation uses assumes hardware accelerated crypto so because the presented xts proxy module supports only x86 platforms and finally your mileage may vary don't uh, jump in and mean immediately enable this flag on your system you know, try to measure it first compare results before the like, widespread deployment and actually let us know the results it would be interesting how does it improve or uh, worsen the performance on your workflow and finally here are some useful links uh, the first link is uh, to the crypt setup project the user space portion of uh, 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 the uh, linux disk lux uh, and dm crypt and linux disk encryption uh, in general uh, it also has some uh, wiki and uh, and information the second uh, link is uh, a man page for, for the low-level DM setup utility. You might need it to uh, enable our custom flags if you use our custom patches. Uh, the third link is uh, a link to my blog post uh, describing all the information I presented here and even more with links and like more digestible, readable format. You can also copy-paste comments from there to actually reproduce the whole setup. I I presented here in this presentation and walk through it yourself uh, and uh, the fourth link is that we published these patches on our uh, company uh, repository is uh, on github so you can actually grab the patches and try them out yourself and the fifth link is recently that uh, the reworked and reviewed version of uh, the patch to the encrypt was accepted into the mainline linux uh, it's a little bit it was a little bit modified so instead of having one flag like in this presentation it now has two flags so you can independently control it, uh, whether to bypass uh, the dmcrypt work use for reads and for writes and basically if you have linux kernel 5.9 and above uh, you, you don't need the patches anymore so you can use a mainline in linux kernel to do that and actually the latest release of crypt, crypt setup uh, user space utility includes support for these new flags so you don't have to even you don't even have to mess with the dm setup utility to configure it well that's basically it thank you for your attention and i'm now ready to answer any questions you may have have a nice day, stay safe, and bye.